I was thinking in the shower this morning, you're one of those people who's been famous for so long that people feel like, oh, I know a lot about Mike Rowe, but really, I'm not sure that I do, and I'm like a mega fan. So just give us, give us like the five minute how you got to where you are now. Like, where are you from? How'd you get here? I'm gonna need one minute to get past the whole notion of you thinking of me in the shower. <laughs> I literally was thinking of the shower. I'm like, so what do we know about Mike Rowe? Let's just pretend that happened. <laughs> I grew up on a little farm in Baltimore County next to a man named Carl Noble, who was my grandfather and only went to the seventh grade and uh, started working when he was young, became a master electrician by the time he was 30, and then went on to become one of those geniuses who could take your watch apart blindfolded put it back together fix anything build anything oh, i love people like that and so he was a magician and i kind of grew up in his shadow with my mom and dad my younger brothers and there they were so uh and you live next door we live right next door on a little hilltop it was a great piece of property because the state couldn't develop the woods behind us on account of the uh, the power lines that yes. ran through it and we had a stream on the other side and lowlands that made the whole area undevelopable. Undevelopable. So we had, you know, like 80 acres. We didn't own it, but nobody could get to it. How far from Baltimore City? This is the crazy thing. Maybe three miles, if. So for the first 12 years of my life, I thought I was Mark Twain or, or like Huck Finn, like in the middle of nowhere. In reality, we were actually very close to the city, but we just never really saw it. It was a very simple childhood. My dad and my grandfather woke up clean every morning and came home dirty after fixing something putting in a you know a, a root cellar or you know laying pipe here building a stable there we had horses you know my mom was a big a big rider and so I, I had a, a privileged uh, albeit very modest uh, childhood I didn't know it was modest. My and so all the drama in B Baltimore which is this great manufacturing center for yeah. many many years steel town oh yeah kind of declined at exactly the moment that you were growing up there. Well, yeah, there was some crossover. My dad, he moonlighted at Bethlehem Steel. He yep. also was over at the Broning GM plant for a while, like a lot of men were in those days. Uh, but it was, Baltimore was a big, small town. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was a great place for me to grow up next to and eventually move to. But look, the short version is regarding Dirty Jobs and my granddad, Dirty Jobs, I was 42 when I pitched that idea, and it was a tribute to him because the handy gene, as you may have noticed, is um, recessive, right? <laughs> and as certain as I was that I would follow in his footsteps, I just didn't get the, I just didn't get the skills. So I got into entertainment and started impersonating a host, which I did for probably 20 years. I sang in the Baltimore Opera for eight years. Oh wait, I so did. did you did you go to school or what? How did you get? So what happened to me was um, when I got out of high school, I was, I, I'd taken some tests and did pretty well and got a lot of pressure from my guidance counselor to look into University of Pennsylvania, James Madison, had no money and had no idea what I wanted to do, right? So that was my first uh, run in with expectations vis-a-vis -vis education. Yes. My parents who both taught public school were were very cool about the whole thing. They said, look, it's important to be curious and it's important to study, but borrowing money, let's maybe not do that. And so I- Even when it was pretty cheap, relatively speaking. It was pretty cheap, but the only four letter word in my house growing up that was really verboten <laughs> was debt. And so the, the idea of borrowing money yes. to get an education, it just seemed anathema, you know? So I went to a community college for two and a half years. And I studied <clears throat> everything. At 18 bucks a credit, you know, you can afford to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right? And so I dabbled with philosophy and English. You know, it was my grandpa who told me a few years earlier, you know, when I completely failed at the whole trades thing, he's like, look, you can be a tradesman, Mike. Just get a different toolbox. Community college was the beginning of that. I took acting classes, I took writing classes, I took singing classes. Were they pretty good? Um, I thought they were great. They, they were. They were challenging for me because this career that I'm in now was not the vocation that I ever thought I would pursue. I, I had no real passion for it. In well, you're fact, the only one in the vocation, so yeah. So. Well, I had a like I had a stammer when I was a kid, you know, and I was really shy, and I just didn't like the whole notion of being around cameras and things was just. You had a stammer? Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, you're famous for your voice, so that's a it's weird. weird. Well, it wasn't like a full-on Porky Pig, you know. I'll be able to be that, you know. <laughs> but it, it could get bad, and it was bad enough to keep me uh, to keep me quiet. I got very lucky, you know. There've been some men in my life: my dad, my granddad, and a high school teacher named Fred King, who's a music teacher, who uh, taught me that, of course, you can't stutter when you sing. Yes. And then he made me audition for a play once, and going on stage and fumbling through a monologue, knowing, knowing that I was going to stammer all over myself. I did it because he asked me to. I trusted him that much. And I remember I got about 20 seconds into it and I'm tripping and you know, the words are sticking in my throat. And Fred King says, Mikey, Mikey, I really like what you're doing with, with the part, but the character doesn't stutter. So why don't you do that on your own time? Try it once without all that, <laughs> right? I mean, it was so glib. Right, I mean, and, and believe me, I'm not saying this would work for people with a stutter if it's a physiological problem. Right. But mine wasn't, mine was in my head. And so I immediately went back to the beginning and I did it without a stammer. As a character who doesn't stutter. And about 20 seconds into it, I look out and Fred's sitting in the audience with you know a few other people and he goes, and that was like a moment where I thought, you know what, I'm gonna act like somebody who doesn't stutter for a while and see where that goes. And- That is I, deep. Well, it was it was simple, you know, and, and, and teachers nowadays, you know, I wish they had permission to do that kind of thing more, right? Yeah. To, to, to challenge kids more. Fred King was not a politically correct teacher. He was a he was a lover of the arts, but he was also a retired Golden Glove boxer, uh, an all state football player, Navy man. He was a tough guy who would cry when he recited poetry and weep when he sang these old sentimental songs. Oh. He was literally known as the king of the barbershoppers. He ran, basically he was a legend in the Barbershop Harmony Society. Yes. And he, he brought me into this world of four-part harmony. The course of the Chesapeake, not far from Bethlehem Steel, met every Tuesday night. And Tucker, this was, I didn't realize it at the time because you normally don't realize the big moments in your life that are shaping you, but. This was a group of maybe 120 men, most of whom were veterans. Many had fought in the Korean War, some in Vietnam, and a lot in the Second World War. This was 1979. And every Tuesday night, I'd go down there to the city hospital where they rehearsed, and then we'd go to Johnny Jones, this little hole in the wall in Highland Town. And I sat there, you know, watching these men break off in groups of four, and they'd blow a pitch pipe, and they'd start singing these old songs from another century I'd never heard of. And they taught me these songs, you know, and they'd, these were songs of sweethearts and, and, and friends who would never let you down and war and love of country and patriotism. And these men, they'd cry as they sang, you know, and then they'd bring me in and they'd teach me a part. And um, I'm probably talking to you today because at, the, at that time in my life, just the right forces, just the right circumstances conspired to show me what art looked like and work. Yes. And through the eyes of men, like hardened, tempered yes. men, who would nevertheless cry like a baby in the midst of some old Tin Pan Alley song. Because they could afford to, because there's no question about. Because there was no shame. Right. You know, and, and, and those songs spoke the truth. You know, the, the, those are, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna, whine about the music today, but the music of the last century was different because there was no, it channeled real feelings like, like grief and, yes. and, and pain and, and, and the suffering complexity and betrayal. Of life. Yeah. And I mean, getting a look at that songbook at such an early age uh, was important to me in, in ways that honestly, I didn't realize until, until Dirty Jobs started many, many years later. Because that show brought me back face to face with a lot of those types of men. That was very personal for me, that show. It was, like I said, a tribute to my pop. So what did you do? So the 20 years between getting out of community college and pitching dirty jobs, what did you do? Well, out of community college, I, uh, I went to work for a bit. I, uh, I auditioned and got into the Baltimore Opera because, not because I wanted to sing, but because I could, and because I needed my union card to work in the Screen Actors Guild, but you can't get your Screen Actors Guild unless you audition for shows that are 
run by the Screen Actors Guild, and you can't get an agent unless you have your card, and you can't get a card unless you have your agent, and so forth. However, if you can get into the American Guild of Musical Artists, the union that oversees the opera, then you can buy your Screen Actors Guild card. So, my business plan out of community and college. And get the health insurance, which is good. You bet. And the girls. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So this is a 80 people in a rep company, you know, and we all on stage with the best singers in the world. Pavarotti came through, Domingo came through, you know, and suddenly I'm, I'm singing some of the greatest pieces ever composed. And it was great. I was 22 years old, dressed as a pirate, you know, singing at the top of my lungs. How I got in, it was like, they gave me a break. I learned the shortest aria I could find. I sang it as loud as I could during an open call. In Italian. In Italian, yeah. It was uh, from La Boheme, the coat aria. And uh, I sang it for a guy named Bill Yanuzzi, who was the musical director there at the time. But I, on and on I go, and I get done and he says, uh, you, um, you have no idea what you're saying, do you? <laughs> and I said, no, sir, I, I, I don't. <laughs> so he explained what the aria meant, and then he had me sing it in another key, and then another key after that. And uh, he said, yeah. We need uh, young guys with low voices. You're in. And so I got in, I got my card. And then I bought my SAG card and then I figured I'd be done with it, but the music turned out to be better than I thought. And I made some great friends and I had another look at a world I didn't really know existed. Barbershop and Grand Opera, one after the next. Then I went to a university for a couple years, Towson. Yeah. And got my credentials because I figured it couldn't hurt, and I was still curious to learn stuff. Uh, then I went to work in this industry they, uh, as a communicator, because I got my communications degree. <laughs> now, I, I checked the one ads. <laughs> you know, people weren't hiring communicators, but my, uh, my degree helped me. Well, my education helped me. Yes. I don't, I don't know that my degree did or didn't, but I do know that later my experience in that community college and in that university led to the foundation that I run today, which actually has nothing to do with, with college at all. No. It everything to do with training. Just the opposite. Well, you know. But, but, but what did you do? What was your first gig out of, out of Towson? Oh, well, there were a lot of non-showbiz gigs, selling magazines over the phone, selling water purifiers out of the back of my trunk. I had a lot of sales jobs because I could create the illusion of credibility and competence in yes. short bursts, which as you know, comes in. <laughs> yes, it does. It comes in handy. That's a critical skill for television. Um, no, my, my, I mean, the opera was my first actual paid gig in entertainment. And then after that, it was just a cavalcade of freelance, right? It was um, QVC was, yeah. the, was, was the biggie. I, uh, I was sitting one evening in the, in the Mount Royal Tavern during the intermission of something called the Ring to Snibel Luncheon, dressed as a Viking, I went over to watch the football game and drink a beer, which I recommend if you're going to be singing German. And uh, the football game wasn't on. There was a big guy in a shiny suit selling pots and pans. And the bartender was auditioning the next day for that guy's job. QVC was doing a national talent search. And I sat there and I, I thought it might be the end of Western civilization. You know, I mean, a 24 hour commercial. <laughs> but I also thought, I. I think I can do that. Oh, for sure. I, th I think I can do that, you know. So yeah, the next day I went with the bartender to audition and I got high. I talked about, I talked about a pencil for eight minutes, which was the audition in those days. That is a rare skill. I don't know that it's a skill. It's a proclivity. <laughs> and, and I had it, you know. Look, it's, it's actually really interesting. There was no playbook in 1990 for what would make a successful home shopping host. Right. Actors couldn't really sell. Salesmen sometimes seized up in front of the camera. Yes. So how do you determine if you're talking to somebody who can actually do that job? Well, you hire an opera singer, obviously. <laughs> Look, you, the first thing you say is, we can't. We just don't know. And to their credit, they did. But they needed some sort of protocol. Oh, they rolled a pencil across the table and they turned on the camera, turned on the red light and said, uh, when I say action, Mike, pick up the pencil, make me want it. Don't stop talking until I, st until I tell you to stop. Make me want Make it. me want the pencil. And so they don't tell you when you start, but 
if you can do that for eight minutes straight, you're hired. I'd hire you in a second. Anyone who can do that for eight minutes is an amazing person. Well, look, either that or they've had got a tremendous amount of time on their hands and they took a lot of courses that didn't really benefit them directly, but did obliquely help them do virtually. What did you say about the pencil for eight minutes? Well, the first thing you do is you, is you get into the, the obvious feature benefit, right? It's yellow, that's the feature, but What's the benefit? Well, you're a busy person, and when you open your cluttered desk drawer looking for the pencil, that bright canary yellow pops out. So you don't waste valuable time rummaging around <laughs> for the instrument. Right? Uh, you talk about the eraser, uh, but not just the fact that it's there. You talk about the fact that it's there in the exact proportion needed to last the life of the pencil based on careful studies that will indicate the amount of erasing the average pencil will require during the course of its life as you sharpen it it gets smaller so this pencil is made with everything you need and nothing you don't right and then of course you talk about the little silver thing that attaches the eraser to the pencil now in my case i said it's actual silver which is rare that's why the pencil is twenty dollars but <laughs> the money that we raise from this pencil will come back to help the kids in madagascar why because madagascar graphite is what's inside not lead and that's important because if you lick the tip of lead, well, you'll go crazy with the poisoning from the lead. But the Madagascar graphite, right? So I'm just, I'm just making crap up. I'm just, I'm just, I just go on and on and on. And then, you know, then I'm two minutes in. So you start talking about yourself. You know, the first love letter I wrote to Heather Klebe, I wrote in a pencil. The first crossword puzzle I ever did. And the last one I do in pencil because you need to be able to correct your your mistakes. Every great theorem from Einstein was written in a pencil. The list goes on. You know? So so you start talking about the impact of a pencil, not just on Western civilization, but on the individual who wields it. And you, and you craft it as a tool. And when you put it in the hands of a tradesman, well, what comes out the other end? If you're Picasso, priceless sketches. Now, the question is, the pencil goes to you. And what will you do with it?